Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, frankly, I, the idea of a freedom of information law had not caught my fancy until it became a hot topic of discourse and thus forced a division, one rather nasty in certain cases, between the press, the surrogate and watchdog for the people in their right to know any and all information that bears upon their lives, on the one hand, and on the other, the custodians of that information. Uh, in fact, I don't recall the FOI idea occurring at all in my time a, as a working member of the press, if that's not obvious enough. Uh, I wouldn't think it anyone's default, though. I'd rather think it had to do with the nature of the time. There are two things. First, the information environment in my time was so plainly laid out, it was easy enough for a reporter to dig up the news. And second, if a new subject or source was not forthcoming enough, some conscience pricking did it. That time is definitely past. The right to know is today up against the power to conceal or confuse or defraud. Worse, that power is wielded conspiratorially. And a question is, there are two questions. One is that, is a freedom of information law the answer? Indeed, if it is, then how? The second question is given that laws are selectively implemented and justice selectively dispensed in this country, is it really a problem of law or is it a problem of culture? To show how contentious the subject is, I am told that more than 20 versions of the law are around. Now, that begs an even larger question, and I hope to some extent we'll be able to answer them today. In the first panel that I have been asked to facilitate, we have three panelists. The first one is His Excellency Thomas Sosowski, Ambassador of the Republic of Germany. Mr. Sosowski came in March, only in March, and he has served in the German Foreign Office since 1992. Before coming, he worked as the deputy of staff of the German foreign minister after an assignment as the foreign office head and European Union policy coordinator. I've been to Afghanistan as the civilian head of the German provincial reconstruction team, political advisor to the ISAF commander. He was also in Rwanda and uh, where he worked as deputy head of the German embassy. The second member of the panel is Dr. Julie Minoves, President of Liberal International. Mr. Minoves is currently the President of the Liberal International. He's an economist, a political scientist, serves Foreign Minister of Andorra from 2001 to 2007. He was appointed Minister of Public Affairs, of Culture, Higher Education at the time. And from December 2007 to May 2009, he was Minister of Public Affairs of Economic Development, Tourism, Culture, and Universities. The third member, Gemma herself, Gemma Mendoza, research and content strategist for Rappler. Uh, Gemma serves as a bridge between uh, editorial and, and, and the technical side of the business at Rappler. So shall we call them up to the stage so we can start the discussion? Let's give them a hand.
I intend to ask a basic question each. And after that, we'll, have, we'll open the floor for, for questions. Uh, first, I'd like Mr. Rosalski to give us an idea of how this damn thing works in his country. Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, in Germany, the Freedom of Information Act only came into force in 2006. So we are we're also quite late um, on this topic. But it involved a whole paradigm change. Before, the current opinion in public administration was that public administration has to protect a certain secrecy because there are so many important things we're dealing with. And the paradigm change in 2005 when the law was being discussed in the parliament was no, it's not right any longer that the government has the right to secrecy. On the contrary, the public has the right to transparency. So this change took place. It was a very important change to say that the public has right, the right of access to information. And so only in special cases, exemptions, the government can kind of withhold this information. For example, when it's about current negotiations, things which are also very common for companies when they are in a negotiation process with some other companies when they have to do or fulfill a certain order. Of course, it's uh, all right that they protect their uh, secrecy in order not to um, um, threaten the deal they are going to make. So it's also important sometimes for the government, especially in diplomacy, that you cannot reveal everything uh, at, the, at, the, at the kind of re in real time. But it is very important uh, to note that this right to openness and transparency had been established then by law. And as a matter of fact, that is just kind of an answer to the globalized world. Uh, today, everyone has so much access to information and it is just one very important element of checks and balances every democracy has to respond to. Government must be controlled, and government today is controlled by transparency and by giving the information the public needs. So I think it is a process which we are all undergoing, and especially the young generation. I mean, when I went to school, we didn't have internet yet. So <laughs> we have this I mean, we are the generation who lived without internet, and we are, it's like, you know, there was a generation before the invention of the wheel and the uh, generation after the invention of the wheel. It's almost like that. We, the, 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 the invention of the wheel of the 21st century is the internet and information, access to information. And so it's very important that government complies with it and uh, prepares the way for it. But it seems to me that you've gotten by nicely enough even without the internet in your time. Sorry? It seems to me that you have gotten nicely enough even without the internet in, my, in, in your time, which in my time I've gotten nicely enough not having any FOI, FOI law. Is that a matter of, of, of culture, of time, or, or what? Is it, it, has it to do with, with uh, where we have come, come today? That kind of... Still on me? Well, uh, you see, information has multiplied, of course. Uh, perhaps we don't note it. Uh, perhaps 20 years ago, we didn't have so much information. Um, <coughs> but today, uh, information is just everywhere in real time, and governments have to comply with it. Of course, it's a certain burden for government, uh, because at the time when we have all to restrain our budgets, cut down on government staff, cut down on empl employees, at the same time, our tasks are increasing, and believe me, being part of uh, ministerial bureaucracy, I know how much more burden this transparency has put on our shoulders. It is kind of, sometimes it, it, yeah, yeah. it's more work. It's more work to comply with, but um, <coughs> definitely information has multiplied in an um, enormous amount. So, I mean, uh, it is a very just question to ask uh, where we misinformed or very badly informed 20 years ago. No, we were also well informed, but uh, it's a different uh, surrounding now. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Now, Dr. Minong, in your, in your travels, how do you see the idea impact on people, especially uh, in the development world? In the developing world? Well, I think that, uh, in fact, what I see globally is that freedom of information is more and more recognized as a part of a, a human right, the, the human right of freedom of speech, which uh, has been recognized for, for many years. And sometimes, you know, as we advance in our understanding of democracy, and also with the help of the new technologies and whatnot, we realize that certain things that seem like a privilege before are actually a right that people don't need to ask. People have the right to access information. Now, this, of course, uh, is combined with another human right, which is the right to privacy, which is also like important. And the balance was, in the past, more towards the right to privacy. But nowadays, in the age of internet, in the age of WikiLeaks, in the age of uh, accessible information for everybody, you know, whether you want it or not, information will be available. So it needs to be recognized as a right, and people need to be able to actually access all of this information. And governments should not be afraid of that. You know, if you're a democratic government, you're ruling for the demos, for the people, you should not be afraid of that. And I think that is seen everywhere, because we do live in a kind of global society. So whether it's a, a country of the West or a developing country, you saw the list of countries that have passed Freedom of Information Acts, Many are in the developing world more and more. So I don't see much of a, of a dichotomy or a, or, a, or a difference between developing countries and, non, and developed countries in this, in this uh, area. I think that it affects us all. Although, it doesn't it seem to you that in cases of the developing world, the idea of, uh, of a freedom of information is something that is taken uh, domestically, insularly? You know, it, they don't really look out there and, 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 and see that this is something that will make us, uh, put us in a, in, a, in a proper place in the global scheme of things. This is something very, the, the, the interest is very domestic in, in most of the developing world. Yes, but see, maybe because, you know, I represent 120 parties, political parties in 80 nations, I tend to look at the big picture. Yes. And frankly, um, I think every country, you know, is, is advancing on this issue. I think in 10 or 15 years, we'll have the majority of the world will have freedom of information acts. We hope, at least the democracies. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Minovas. Now, Gemma, I am, I'm curious myself. In your studies, uh, did, you get any, did you get any idea of how this freedom of information environment works in, say, China or Pakistan? Sorry. Uh, we, we didn't look closely into China and Pakistan, but what we have seen is that um, well, typically, because we, we compared um, a lot of countries, we looked at the governance indicators, for instance, because we wanted to look at whether uh, it affects, it really affects governance. So. Uh, in many countries, uh, it did help improve uh, governance indicators, but it's not always the case uh. because there are also countries which uh, are also undergoing turmoil. Mm -hmm. Or, um, e for instance, Ukraine has a very strong uh, FOI law, but where are they right now? So, um, so, so. Uh, in general, it, I mean, it has uh, had an impact in a lot of countries, as we have mentioned, but uh, there are countries where, uh, I guess, it, one thing, one one way to look at it is um, the FOI is a tool that countries who are undergoing democratic transitions use to force openness, to force democratic space. That's how we yeah. we see it. On the particular point of personal privacy, which is an exemption, mm -hmm. I wonder how it relates to, uh, to people in public office. Because you cannot, I mean, it becomes an issue of character when it comes to public office. That's yeah. interesting, yeah. because actually in the UK, one of the cases where uh, FOI has been invoked uh, uh, in re 
um, the Information Commissioner has ruled to make expenses of uh, um, uh, uh, parliamentary members uh, available to the public. And this is uh, still undergoing a lot of debate in, in that country. So, so that's another, like, uh, some say it's because of it's very intrusive because they'll have to reveal certain types of information. But again, the, the question is really, and in most countries that we study, the balancing act is like uh, you have privacy but also public interest. And public interest uh, meaning like um, are, are funds abused, are, are funds misused? Yeah. Well, at, at this point, we'd like to open the discussion to the floor. Anyone who has a question to any of our panelists, please just rise and identify yourself and do shoot your questions. Anyone? Oh. Ambassador Villacorta would like would like to ask. Uh, good morning. Um, first of all, allow me to congratulate the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for, for sponsoring this symposium because this is what the liberals are all about. We are for, for freedom of all sorts. One thing that is not emphasized from, from the start of uh, the sponsorship of several bills on freedom of information is that the provision in the Constitution, the Philippine Constitution, uh, is in the Bill of Rights. You see, in any constitution of any democratic country, uh, the Bill of Rights is considered to be the most important. And strictly speaking, you don't need and enabling legislation to implement it. And if we look at, uh, I have the Constitution here. <laughs> if you look at, the, at Section 7, Article 3 of the Bill of Rights, you can find the right of the people to information. It's a basic right now, not only in the 21st century, it is a basic human and civil right. Now, why are our lawmakers dragging their feet? People say, if we had FOI, maybe we would not have PDAF. I'd like to phrase it differently. They don't want the FOI because of PDAF. That's what they're hiding all along. So. This right, in fact, it should not be called freedom of information. Because in, in legal parlance, based on jurisprudence of different countries, the freedom of information is usually, uh, although now, in, as was uh, shown by the, by the study of Rappler, most of them are legislative measures not contained in the Constitution. But the Philippine Constitution of 1987, and uh, Dr. Braid can bear me out because both of us co-sponsored this provision. Uh, the freedom, what you call freedom of information, but it is rightly called right to information. It's a right, it's not just a freedom is in section seven very clearly stating that the right of the people to information on matters of public concern, concern shall be recognized. It's as clear as daylight, right? Now, of course, it's the only right in the Bill of Rights that says subject to such limitations as may be provided by law. I can mention, I'm, I'm, this is my last sentence, I can mention that uh, the intention of this clause 
was to make was not to make it difficult for an enabling law to be passed, but simply to address the concerns of the other members of the Constitutional Commission about the need to protect national security. All that, if, if we are to follow the intention of this provision, all that has to be enabled is a law protecting the national interest, that's all. But it is to be taken for granted that the right of the people to information on matters of public concern must definitely be implemented like the other provisions of the Bill of Rights. Sorry for talking yeah. too long. <laughs> no, it's okay. Well, deducing from uh, Mr. From Bartot Villacorta's point, uh, there seems to me an amplitude of law and an equal amplitude of crime, which doesn't seem to balance off the, the, the other. That's one point. The, the, the other point that is that a law necessarily limits uh, the definition of terms so that a freedom of information, of information law necessarily limits the definition of public information. I, I wonder what anyone has to say about that. That is always a, this is a fear, this is a fear in this particular society because of this society's history and culture. I mean, it is something that we, we, we tend to be, to be afraid of these things because of, given the, given the history that we have gone through. I, I wonder if Dr. I mean, obviously, would have anything to say Yes, about yes, of course. Well, I totally agree with Ambassador Villacorta. I, you know that uh, it is a right, uh, but not only a right in the Filipino constitution, um, but also, as I say, uh, quite an internationally recognized human right to have information. It's part of the freedom of speech. It is important for people to be informed, to be able to have form opinion and whatnot. So, and, and as many rights, sometimes they don't become apparent you know, or did not become apparent as such in 1948 with the Declaration of International Declaration of Human Rights, but slowly we're coming to terms with, with this understanding that freedom of information is a right of the people, not just something that governments can give them or not at their own pleasure. Now, it's very good that in the Filipino Constitution you have it spelled out clearly and strongly, but still you do need a law to actually spell out how to uh, uh, implement it, right? Because it's uh, uh, an abstract right in the Constitution does not say, for example, which exceptions there are and, and how to like, you know, give the information, what's the, 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 the number of days that, that, that you can wait or not to give uh, information. So a law will be very good because then uh, the, the right can be exercised. People have clear juridical, um, uh, clear juridical framework and they can say, well, I need this information, and they know that within 10 days or 15 days or two months at the most or something, they will have to get that information. And there's, there's a, a, a civil servant that knows how to actually exercise and, and use that right and give the, the person uh, the information. And if he, he or she doesn't give it, then there's a, a penalty or, or something that, that will happen. So this is important that a part of, beyond the right, we need to have a law that actually helps the right to be implemented. Uh, there's this uh, German philosopher, Friedrich Hegel, who in the 19th century already put that in one very clear sentence. He said, the freedom of the citizen lies in the implementation of the law. And that is why it is, as you say, um, as a matter of fact, not enough just to have it in the constitution or to have it as a human right. You have to have it in a law because that's the only way this right can be organized and the citizen can have access to it. Again, it must have been a matter of, of, of uh, a, a, a matter of the nature of, of the times. These are different times. You know? in, in my time, I felt very comfortable uh, judging for myself what is fair game information. I mean, I didn't have to go anywhere else. I just, I just put it out. I mean, that was another time. Uh, but, uh, but given the complexity and given what uh, the people are up against, are up against, uh, the people who have the right to know any and all information that 
bears upon the lives. You know? and the people are up against, against a, a, a government or custodians of information that have a tendency, especially in this setting, to, to conceal, to obfuscate, and to even defraud. So I, I, I suppose in, uh, I, I suppose all in all, a freedom of information or right to information would be helpful. Yes, Jim. Um, and I, w I would just like to emphasize one thing. So um, yeah, the right is there, but um, the question is, and the tendency uh, that we have seen is that um, there's still um, that, uh, like a lot of public servants tend to like one uh, an, uh, question whether it, the information is part of public uh, uh, data that may be provided to the public, or it's something that has to be uh, to, has to go through approvals. For instance, um, there's a big uh, uh, difference in countries with access to information law. So uh, as we have seen before, UK. Uh, on in def uh, I mean, default, uh, everything is accessible unless uh, yeah. it's in the listed exemptions. And this is very important because um, selective release can be as dangerous as uh, not releasing information at all. We have seen this in the whole um, discussion over the PDAF, over the audits, over... Um, uh, the different lists, the Napoles lists, um, each uh, and each pers personality that was mentioned. I mean, all, I mean, there were so many lists that came out. But what is the uh, what is the full? Uh, I mean, w w I mean, the public has the right to know what's the real picture, and the real picture comes out if uh, if all the data is there. If there is no, uh, there are no filters to, like if we say, okay, so many have received these funds, so many have received uh, the, the uh, disbursement acceleration funds, all that data is actually released, not portion of it. And that is something that happened, I mean, that was actually something that was raised before. Similarly, um, Sal ends. Um, if only um, certain officials release their information and others don't, uh, that's not fair. And um, you, the public does not get the full picture. So, so th that's the reason why uh, such a law is still necessary. Because then uh, that public disclosure I mean, like, what is publicly available? What is a public document? There's, there yes, seems sir. to be that idea that there are public, uh, there's information in government hands that's not public yeah. document. And that has to be, uh, that kind of perception has to be removed, I think. I, at, at any rate, being a rights and freedom extremist myself, mm -hmm. I would not discourage any journalist from deciding for herself or herself what is fair game information. I mean, that's, that's, I think, the position that every journalist should take. You know, she, they should not be discouraged, law or no law, to decide for herself or himself what is fair game information. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Mr. Jung. Thank you. First, an apology for being late, and therefore didn't have the opportunity of getting as educated as the rest of you who are punctual. But uh, my question would go a little bit uh, beyond the right to information and the necessity to get information. And I'm quite pleased to hear the, uh, the uh, clarification of our, uh, our constitution, the uh, embe embedding in the constitution the right to information. I come from a world of regulators, and one of the problems of regulators is the uh, privacy. The privacy, particularly the Philippines Bank Secrecy Act, absolute. 
And so uh, because of that absoluteness, the practical way to do with uh, getting a fair share of the tax was to put a final 20% tax on interest earned. And that today has a lot of uh, complications in capital market distortions. And I could not understand why we cannot pierce that uh, bank secrecy and have that information available to regulators, probably subjected to certain privacy consideration. That level of information is not the same level as the one you're talking of. The one you're talking of, right to information, in my view, must be fundamental every time public funds are touched. Whenever public funds is touched in any manner, wherever benefits must have that information available, be it in terms of tax exemption or subsidies. So I'm not so sure <clears throat> whether any of these uh, acts of uh, confidentiality, despite the fact that we use public funds, is constitutionally correct. It probably is unconstitutional following uh, the clarification from Ambassador Porter. But I would like to pierce a bit into your area of bank secrecy. Because there, I think the people responsible for having sound financial <coughs> system must have the ability to know the true liabilities of any financial institutions that they allow the public to put money into. But to put that into a blind hole because of uh, the privacy consideration, I don't know if that is something you can share with us, whether any country in the world have such an absolute secrecy on authority to look into. That's definitely material to the Philippine public interest. Yes, <laughs> no doubt, yes. yes. Yeah. Because in that situation, we end up with a kind of a high poverty rate, over 20%, with 40 persons in the Philippines owning over 70% of yes. the wealth of the country. That is a consequence of this kind of uh, absence of knowledge. Well, I think that, uh, sir, you are touching upon something that is very important. Bank secrecy worldwide is not and should not be absolute. Yeah. You know, it's very clear. And uh, there's been you know, a lot of progression on this issue particularly in the European continent, where uh, a lot of exchange of information has been happening, and, and uh, uh, countries in the European Union and outside of the European Union, with the European Union, have been very good, I think, in the past at least decade or so, to uh, have agreements to share information. And, of course, uh, information that concerns money and funds uh, that are illegal, that, are, uh, uh, that come from, from, from crooks, basically, who are... Uh, deal with drugs and we deal with, with crime and whatnot, should not be shielded. Should not be shielded, and we should be very clear on that at the international level. Uh, uh, that is actually immoral in the international uh, sphere. The other, the other issue is, is funds that are uh, ill-acquired, of course, by, by people in, in certain countries that are put in other countries and preserved. There shouldn't be uh, secrecy of that. Whenever the, the public fund has been ill-acquired, uh, it should be, like, you know, and a government has proven that, uh, the countries that shield it should actually release those, those, that information and should actually return that money whenever like, the, the, the home country requests it and uh, there's a, a judicial proceeding that allows for that. You know? And I think I was talking with the Swiss ambassador who was here before and uh, the Marcus uh, uh, money in Switzerland was returned to the Philippines. I think it was uh, quite a few hundred million uh, euros at the time uh, uh, after it was proven that it was ill-acquired. Uh, so, you know, the, these, the cooperation in these matters is important, and I think uh, the level of the OECD, of course, uh, uh, it is being tackled in a very uh, clear way. The, the, there's a, countries are classified in a certain list of uh, those who are cooperative and those who are, are not cooperative, so there's, a, there's an effort there. But also at the European level, there's been a, a huge effort, and uh, I think in the European continent, which much beyond that. So not only freedom of information at the local level, at the country level, but also at the international level is important. Now, let me just maybe quickly say something that I think is important too in terms of like 
You know, we tend to assume that the freedom of information is only because, you know, there's going to be corruption or there's going to be uh, some kind of crime committed or something and being concealed. I think sometimes, you know, governments are reluctant to release information for fear of criticism. You know, it's a human, you know, normal fear. You know, I've been in government and you know that. You're just like, you open the paper in the morning and there's all these news that you've done this badly and then the other thing badly or whatever. But it's the price of democracy. We need to learn, politicians need to learn to, to, need to, learn to live with it. You know, it's, it's information is out there. If you run for office, if you put yourself out there, exactly. you are accountable. Exactly. And you need to be accountable on your private, uh, uh, and your, not your private, you know, everyday acts, but everything you do that touches the public trust. You know, whether you spend money from the public, whether you actually, whatever you do, you're, you're out there and you've put yourself out there to be voted and elected, so deal with it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, accountability improves also your own patterns of behavior. When you know that you have to justify your, the things you're doing, then you also, right from the start, you behave in a much, much better way. And that's also the reason why, sir, I also believe that the bank secrecy has, also, has uh, to be uh, uh, carefully scrutinized and we have to make some serious effort in that because the financial crisis in 2008 with Lehman Brothers, starting with Lehman Brothers, that was very much the result of intransparent and even irrational banking behavior. So um, to expose also the banks and the financial institutions to more transparency will also improve their acting and their actions and uh, will expose some decisions which ha would have not been made if the rationality of public scrutiny would have been there. So I think it's also very, very important that we work on that topic. We have been working on that very much in the European Union in the last years. Uh, some progress has been made, but it's, uh, work in, uh, it's ongoing work. Thanks. Any, any more questions? But I think Mr. Leung is more interested in the time, timeliness with which secrecy lifted, is, is lifted. Yeah, the timeliness with which secrecy is lifted. Because while we got some money from from, from Mr. Marcos, it was did a paltry sum and it took a long, long time. And so it, it, it's not, it's not, it is, uh, it is more the timing of, of the lifting of secrecy. Any, any more questions? Any more? Do I take it that everyone has been enlightened enough? <laughs> okay, yes, yes. Uh, good morning. Yeah. I'm uh, Dr. Danuk from De La Salle University. <clears throat> My concern is how to quickly uh, put this into a law. Uh, if Sweden had it uh, 1776 and we don't have it at right now, I, don't, I wonder what kind of democracy we have. Uh, I also understand that uh, there are models uh, from which we can learn how to quickly pass this into law. Uh, I believe Indonesia passed this law at a time when nobody was talking about it. Uh, so, is there, uh, are there models, uh, this is addressed to Ms. Mendoza, are there models uh, from which we can learn how to do it right and quick uh, so that by 2016, uh, not only that we will be concerned about corruption, but about also health of uh, people running for 2016, their health, uh, privacy about their lives should be openly discussed as uh, open and as free as possible. Because I believe that good governance is also open governance. And open governance requires freedom of information. Thank you. Well, in, in the countries we studied, it's really more uh, an active push. Like India, 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> to get a law passed, uh, an active push by citizens, by media, uh, to for for access. So it's it's still an ongoing struggle for many countries. Some countries are still undergoing. Or, or, I mean, in some countries, uh, there are still active um, efforts to amend current laws. Like the the more recent laws are the ones 
that rated really high with penalty clauses and oversight uh, functions, uh, oversight bodies. But previous uh, laws don't have that. So there, uh, I wouldn't say there's a model for passing, but I guess the reason why uh, the, the, when we were looking at this, what, what we thought is um, here in the Philippines, uh, we feel that there's no feeling that it's urgent. There, there, there seems to be no uh, recognition that it's urgent because, uh, yeah, you have a mandate, you have a, uh, you have um, some frame, some sort of framework. But what we wanted to show is it's not enough. And in fact, in other countries, this is how it's done. I mean, baliktad instead of uh, instead of limiting, because the tendency for public officials is they're afraid to release. So they get the approval of their bosses. So instead of limiting, uh, the others make it like default, gov it's available unless it's in the exempted list. So um, it's really active citizen <laughs> push that got a lot of the laws passed. Okay, it looks like this is it for this section, for this session. And let us thank our panel for the trouble. Thank you. Thank you very much.